When you play through Elden Ring, you'll inevitably run up against bosses or areas that will humble you. In these moments, it's important to remember that these obstacles are often there by design. They do not block the path, they are the path. Through skill, or creativity, or just by coming back later, you can overcome any obstacle in this game, and this video will give you all the tools you need to do so. Before you do anything else, you should try to master the basics of combat. At the core of combat is your stamina bar. This resource is depleted when you perform the actions necessary for fighting. For example, sprinting, dodging, blocking attacks, attacking, all of these things, and more, require stamina. Next, let's talk about the proper flow of combat. While locked on with R3, keep your shield raised with L1. This will prevent damage from any attacks that are too fast for you to react to. As you block them, your stamina bar will be depleted, so make sure to drop your shield in between attacks in order to regain that stamina faster. Now, blocking fast attacks often doesn't deplete too much of your stamina, but blocking slow attacks is often a different story, and a lot of them can easily break your guard, leaving you wide open. Thus, if you think you can anticipate a slow attack or a series of attacks, it's often better to roll through them instead. Rolls have invincibility frames that nullify all damage if you press the roll button around the instant where you would have been hit. And while this is more difficult to do than blocking, avoiding damage in this way is way more stamina efficient than just blocking. Oh, and make sure that you stay below 70% equipment load as well, so that your rolls stay fast and effective. As you fight an enemy, pay special attention to their animations and try to memorize their moveset. Over time, you will learn the best way to avoid certain attacks and where their openings lie. So learn to fight with a mixture of both blocks and rolls. As a general rule, you should block fast attacks and roll through slow attacks. By fighting efficiently in this way, you'll avoid damage and still have stamina left over to deal damage while the boss or enemy is left open. A new way to deal damage in Elden Ring is with guard counters, which are a core part of Elden Ring's combat and essentially allow you to weaponize your own defense. So shortly after successfully blocking an attack, you can retaliate by tapping R2 and performing a guard counter attack. These counters are extremely powerful. If you recognize an opportunity to safely perform one, you should. They deal great damage, and many lesser enemies will immediately have their super armor broken, opening them up for a critical attack with R1. But what is super armor? Well, it's an invisible meter that enemies and bosses have. It depletes when they take damage, and when you fully deplete this meter and break their super armor, you can perform a critical attack by tapping R1. As a rule of thumb, any R2 attack will do more super armor damage. Jumping R2 attacks do a lot, running R2 attacks are great too, but fully charged R2 attacks seem to do the most. Also worth noting is that super armor regenerates over time, therefore it's important that you continually deal damage to your enemies. If you sense a boss is close to breaking point, go on the offensive with your R2 attacks, try to do a lot of super armor damage in a short period of time. Often you'll be rewarded. On the other hand, if you're just looking to do consistent damage, well, tapping R1 is probably the way to go. R1 attacks generally come out much faster, they combo longer, and they're not as risky to perform. And if you really want to prioritize damage over defense, then you can two-hand your weapon. The input for this is to hold triangle or Y, and tap R1 or L1 to two-hand your right-hand item or left-hand item, respectively. In addition to granting you a new moveset, you will have more strength, more damage, more super armor damage, and you can often avoid recoil when striking an enemy's shield. So if your shield just isn't helping much with an encounter, consider two-handing for damage instead. Now while you two-hand, you'll mostly be dodging for defense in this state. That said, it's worth noting that you can still block while two-handing, and while you'll take some chip damage because a weapon isn't as good as a shield is for blocking, it's still a good idea to block in many situations, or at least to keep your guard up, especially if you want to utilize guard counters. Another offensive alternative to two-handing is power stancing, which can be achieved by equipping two weapons of the same class, one in each hand. With this, you'll get access to a special L1 attack that utilizes both weapons. 
just like your R1 attacks, your L1 attacks do a combo of strikes and can be utilized in jumping attacks as well. Speaking of jumping attacks, they're incredible gap closers, allowing you to cover distance and cue an attack simultaneously. If an enemy is left open but you're kind of far away, just close the distance with a jumping attack and see how effective they can be. Jumping R1 attacks are generally better for flying or mounted enemies, and jumping R2 attacks are generally better if you want to inflict damage and posture damage upon grounded enemies. Damage can be healed with your Flask of Crimson Tears, which will always replenish when you warp or sit at a grace checkpoint. Additionally, you can get extra flask charges by clearing out a group of enemies, or by defeating these small red creatures. At grace checkpoints, you can upgrade your flask with golden seeds and sacred tears. Golden seeds are found at minor Erd trees and increase the amount of flasks you can carry. Sacred tears are found at churches of Marika and increase the amount healed by your flasks. Furthermore, you can balance the allotment of crimson flasks versus cerulean flasks at a point of grace to better suit your needs. To quickly access your crimson healing flask at any time, Consider making it the first item on your quick select bar. This way, if you hold down on the D-pad, you'll always shortcut to it instantly. At the top of the D-pad, you'll be able to cycle through your current selection of spells. New spells can be memorized at a site of grace. These spells will either be incantations, which must be cast with an equipped seal, or sorceries, which must be cast with an equipped staff. Cycle through your equipped armaments by pressing left or right on the D-pad. If you die, then you'll drop all of your runes at your point of death. If you don't pick them up during your next life, then they'll be gone forever. Make sure to seek them out using your compass whenever you can, or invest them in items or your own character. When you do die, you can choose to resurrect at a side of grace, or sometimes at a stake of Marika. If you see this statue, or this icon, then it's probably an indication that you're in a difficult area or near a boss as a stake of Marika is nearby. Respawning at a stake of Marika will usually make your run back to your runes less severe, so it's often best to choose that option, unless you'd prefer to move on from what killed you. If you're out in the open world, one way to overcome difficulty is by choosing the right scenarios to fight on your mount. Against large or mounted enemies that struggle against hit-and-run tactics, the mount is definitely the way to go. While mounted, R1 and R2 give you light and heavy attacks on the right side, and L1 and L2 give light and heavy attacks on your left side. If you hold your heavy attack input, then you can charge them up, dealing continuous damage while you charge, which culminates in a strong attack at the end. While mounted, you automatically wield the armament in your right hand. If you would prefer to wield the armament in your left hand, use a two-handing input, so hold triangle or Y, and then tap L1 or R1. Your mount can take damage separately from you, but his damage can be healed by your crimson flasks, as well as by craftable rower raisins. As you get hit on your mount, you run the risk of losing your own super armor and getting knocked down for an extended period of time. If this happens, you are extremely vulnerable. If you're taking damage, then at a certain point, no matter what you're fighting, it's probably wise to dismount and fight them on foot for a little while. Jumping attacks off your horse are a great way to transition into melee combat. Dismount with L3 and slam them with L1, R1 or R2. The distance you cover with this is absurd and initiating a fight in this way gives you an immediate advantage. As the fight goes on, consider if mounting up again for a burst of speed would be to your benefit. Against this flying dragon, for example, certain attacks are better off being outpaced on a mount. For a reliable way to mount up quickly, I would recommend binding your Spectral Steed Whistle to your pouch, a secondary D-pad menu that can be edited in the menu screen. You can quickly access all four of these bindings by holding down triangle or Y, then tapping the appropriate D-pad button. This way, you'll have a consistent input for mounting up instead of toggling rapidly through your items looking for your whistle. This same logic applies to any other item you want quick, reliable access to, like weapon buffs or poison cures. In addition to your double jump for extra height, be on the lookout for spirit springs, which take you to incredible heights 
conversely, you can safely jump into a Spirit Spring to negate all fall damage. While on your mount, L3 dismounts you, but when on foot, L3 can be used for stealth. In this crouched state, enemy aggro range is reduced, and you'll have an easier time getting R1 backstabs. Enemy aggro range is also reduced at night, so consider passing time at a Sight of Grace to better suit your needs. At night, however, you might also find different enemies spawning in the world, so be aware of that. Another thing to get in the habit of is crafting, which you can do as soon as you buy the crafting kit from Kale at the Church of Ella. After this, the crafting tab in your menu screen will unlock for use. After a few hours of play, you should have accumulated a few recipe books to expand your crafting options, and if you've been hunting and foraging between bosses, then you'll be able to make a lot of great items. Pay attention to what material drops you're finding in the world. It'll make it that tiny bit easier to gather more of it when you realize you need it to craft something specific. The crafting page gives you hints at where to find specific materials, and most world materials respawn instantly upon resting at a grace, making them fairly easy to farm. Oh, and while you're at Kale, grab a torch to help you see in dark caves, and when you find one of Kale's fellow merchants on a beach southwest of the Church of Ella, grab a bow as well. Ranged weapons are excellent utility tools, allowing you to lure, poison, or sleep enemies from afar. There are two types of bow weapons, bows and crossbows, which use arrows or bolts, respectively. Enter precision aiming mode with L1 while two-handing the bow, and press R1 to fire the projectile in the first slot, and R2 to fire the projectile in the second slot. So thinking creatively with craftable items or using utility items like bows, that's a great way to overcome difficulty. But sometimes you might just feel like your damage is too low. And in that situation, you'll have to reinforce your weapon, which can be done at the Church of Ella at the smithing table. Here, you'll be able to get most armaments to plus three with smithing stone shards that are found throughout the world. That said, special armaments require other special shards, and to go beyond plus three, you'll need to find an actual blacksmith. Alternatively, if you aren't happy with your shield, take a look at its stats. The most reliable shields are those that block 100% physical damage, but you can consider switching shields to suit specific encounters. The other stat you'll want to look at is Guard Boost. Higher Guard Boost means you'll take less of a stamina hit when you block. Upgrading an armament is a bit of a commitment. You can always find more smithing stone shards in caves and around the world, but these are fairly rare, so make sure you really enjoy swinging a weapon before you upgrade it. Of course, a weapon also has to suit your build. Your build is determined by what stats you decide to level at a grace checkpoint when you summon Melina and invest your runes with her. When you start the game, you'll have to choose a starting character. Some use magic, some have ranged weapons, and some excel in melee. But it's important to remember that your starting class does not dictate your build. You do. While each character's starting stats give them different strengths and weaknesses, you are free to build your character in any direction from this point. If you haven't settled on a build yet, then you can't go too wrong by just leveling Vigor for HP and resistance, Endurance for stamina and equipment load, or Mind to increase your focus points. But it's the other stats that make a real impact on your character archetype. Strength, for example, mostly affects your ability to wield heavy armaments, as well as your defense. Strength weapons are often slow, so being a lot more tanky will come in handy. Another stat to look out for is poise, which will raise as you put on heavier armor, and having high poise will often prevent you getting interrupted mid-attack, which is really good for slow weapons. Dexterity is the counterpart to strength, and it raises your ability to wield a lot of lighter armaments, boosting their attack power. It also softens fall damage, makes it harder for you to be knocked off your horse, and reduces the casting time of spells. Spells usually scale in damage with intelligence or faith. Intelligence generally boosts the damage of sorceries, while faith generally boosts the damage and healing of incantations. Arcane is also a new attribute in Elden Ring, and it governs your discovery stat, which increases enemy item drop rates. It's also a stat that increases the damage of certain sorceries and incantations, and can play into the stat scaling of certain weapons as well. Every weapon comes with a default scaling, 
and your favorite weapon will really influence which build you end up going with. However, one thing you can do is apply an Ash of War to your weapon, which allows you to choose a more beneficial damage type and more beneficial scaling options for that weapon. Beyond their scaling options though, Ashes of War can be used to apply skills to your armaments. Once applied, L2 will unleash their effects, and you can always see which skill you will perform with L2 here. To apply an Ash of War, be sure to pick up the Whetstone Knife in a cellar at the Gatefront Ruins. After this, sit at a Grace Checkpoint and experiment with your options. Often, these skills will default to your Shield's applied Ash of War, unless you two-hand your weapon or use a shield without a special skill. These attacks are very powerful, and even require a small amount of focus points to use. Your FP is represented here in this blue bar. This is a really valuable resource, especially for magic builds which also rely on it to cast spells. That said, all builds can and should find a use for FP, and if you're having trouble in Elden Ring, you should always be thinking of an effective way to make use of this resource. Another powerful way to make use of FP is by summoning spirits. Once you acquire the summoning bell early in the game, you'll be able to equip spirits on your quick select bar and summon them for difficult encounters. As long as you have enough FP, and as long as this rebirth monument symbol marks the encounter as difficult, then your spirits will fight alongside you until death. Some are ranged attackers, some are tanky, and some are a combination of both. Decide what works best for your build and what works best for the encounter as well. Only one type of spirit can be summoned at a time, and spirits cannot be summoned during multiplayer. Speaking of multiplayer, if you're having trouble, be on the lookout for Furl Calling Finger Remedies, which you can find throughout the world. Once consumed, these allow you to see other players summon signs and summon help for major encounters. That said, you'll always be able to see NPC summon signs, so feel free to make good use of them. Alternatively, other players' signs can be accessed in summoning pools located at summoning effigies that are placed in key areas. If you want to learn more about engaging in multiplayer, read the items on your multiplayer tab in the menu screen. In general, if there's a tip that you want to read again that popped up, uh, you can find all of those in your inventory menu all the way at the end. Last, but not least, is your map. Revealing the map for an area will make it way easier to progress through the game. Map fragments can be collected at these glowing guide stells. If you're having trouble finding one in an unfamiliar area, try to stick to the main path, or failing that, try to look for this shape on your undiscovered map. With the map open, you can mark points of interest with markers or beacons that show up in the overworld. You can also fast travel between sites of Lost Grace, or get a clearer idea of the direction that the main story requires. Rays of light will guide you on that path, and often lead you towards your next logical checkpoint. Of course, it's up to you if you want to trust the guidance of Grace. If you're having trouble with the main path, just go in the opposite direction. Explore, get stronger, learn how to master your build. The guidance of Grace can often be spurned to great effect. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more, you can find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash and I wish you all the best in overcoming difficulty in Elden Ring.